Did you know that Colombian ground squirrels are probably one of the most famous mammals in Alberta's parks? Sure, when people go to our provincial parks like those in Kananaskis country, or our national parks like Banff and Jasper, everyone hopes to see our big majestic animals like grizzly bears, wolves, and elk. But the mammals you're most likely to see are these little guys. Colombian ground squirrels are plentiful in grassy meadows in our parks areas, and although many visitors overlook them, they're fascinating animals themselves, and they're an important prey item for many raptors, grizzly bears, weasels, and badgers. Hi, my name is Jeff Lane. I'm a researcher and teacher at the University of Saskatchewan, and my students and I have been studying populations of Colombian ground squirrels in Alberta's Rocky Mountains for over 12 years. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time telling you about something that the ground squirrels do that we find absolutely fascinating, and that's how they spend the winter. The Rockies are a beautiful place to live, but they can also be a challenging one for an animal that doesn't have a warm cabin to live in. So many small birds that live in the Rockies in the summer, for example, will migrate to warmer places that still have food. But what does a ground squirrel lacking wings to do? While they do put on some fat, their bodies aren't large enough to store enough to make it through seven months or more of not eating. So they have a fascinating solution. They hibernate. Hibernation is a strategy used by many of our wild mammals, including ground squirrels, to survive the winter. When an animal goes into hibernation, it will typically go to a safe place, like an underground burrow, slow down so it seems like it's sleeping, and then, and this is the really interesting part, they begin to allow their body temperature and metabolic rate to drop. A metabolic rate is a measure of how much energy your body is using from the food it consumes. So when you are sleeping, for example, your metabolic rate is low. If you go for a run, your metabolic rate increases because your muscles need more energy. In deep hibernation, a hibernating ground squirrel can drop its metabolic rate to over a hundred times lower than what it would be if it were to remain active in the cold. Like many wild species, ground squirrels and other hibernators are being affected by climate change. But the specific effects depend on the species and where they live. For example, marmots living in Colorado have experienced a general warming in the spring, so they're able to emerge earlier, have a longer season to build up fat reserves, and survive better to the following winter. Where we study ground squirrels in Alberta, however, temperatures at the time when the ground squirrels typically emerge haven't changed, but it's become more and more likely that we receive late season snowstorms at this time. Now, ground squirrels don't like to emerge through the snow, so we're finding that they're emerging later and later due to climate change. Unfortunately, this has been associated with lower survival and numbers of babies produced. So in this case, it definitely seems that the ground squirrels are suffering from climate change. We're currently investigating whether the ground squirrels may be able to adapt to these shifted conditions and remain one of Alberta Park's most famous mammals. I'm Lisa Wilkinson with Alberta Environment and Parks. I'm a species at risk biologist and a provincial bat specialist. Bats are amazing creatures. We have at least nine species in Alberta. They all eat insects and they perform a really important role in our ecosystem by being the greatest consumers of nighttime insects. And they're all really quite tiny. What I'm holding here is a mount of a little brown bat. So you can see how small they are. This one weighs about as much as a loony. We have some bats that get a little bit larger, but on the whole, they're really small. Now, because these bats eat insects, they can't survive in the winter without doing one of two things, migrating or hibernating. We have three bat species that do migrate south. The rest hibernate. We don't know exactly where all our bats hibernate. We know of some caves and we think most of them hibernate in cracks and crevices. Hibernation is a really challenging time, especially in the northern climates where winter is very long. So bats could be in hibernation for as much as six months. Certainly here in the mountains of Alberta, they might not be leaving hibernation till May, going in sometime in September or October. In places where the climate is milder, they don't have to be in hibernation for as long. So a bat is faced with the same challenge as a bear before winter comes along. It has to eat as much as it can to put on as much fat as it can to survive the winter. And it's really important that bats aren't disturbed during hibernation. Otherwise they arouse and use up some of that stored fat that they need to get them through to the spring. Now when summer arrives, female bats will give birth to one pup, which is really unusual. Most small mammals have 
uh, large litters. And that's one of the things that make bat populations quite vulnerable is if there's a population decline, it takes a long time for those bat populations to get back up with having only one young per year. Now a mother bat could eat her weight in insects in a night when she's lactating, which is pretty amazing. Another unusual thing about bats is they're very long lived. There was a bat in Alberta that we know lived to be at least 39 years old. And so there are many reasons why bats are important and useful. Eating insects is obviously one of them. They eat pests like mosquitoes, farm and forest pests. And in the US, they, it's estimated they save farmers billions of dollars because they act as a natural pesticide. If you'd like some more information about bats, go to the Alberta Community Bat Program website, albertabats.ca. Hi, my name is John Pachkowski. I'm the park ecologist with Kananaskis Country, and I'm going to take a few minutes and talk to you about grizzly bears and how they spend the winter and how they den. The grizzly bears in Kananaskis Country typically den at about 2,100 meters, which is quite high up, and they take advantage of the, the snowpack, like a big snowy blanket, to get them through the winter, and they'll be up on steep slopes where the snow accumulates rather quickly. But to illustrate that, I'll show you a bit of an example of one of our collar bears, um, Bear 139, and how she uh, navigates into the den and how she gets out of the den. It's pretty cool. So this video clip demonstrates how 139 took her last few final movements of the season before entering the den as she's moving in around Highway 40 in Kananaskis country and uh, feeding on what she can and keep in mind it's quite wintry and snowy at this point so she's moving up high probably digging after roots and berries and just putting on that last little bit of fat before she uh, starts moving into the den and moving in around then she sort of pops along the edge of the road and makes a final move up into her denning spot which is sort of uh, a high a high area above King Creek and she settles in for the winter. Now bears are going into these dens for four to six months and at that point they're not eating, they're not drinking, their physiology slows down, they're only breathing a few times a minute and she might be looking after cubs too so it's a pretty interesting process and it's not really that well understood in science so it's pretty cool. So imagine you've been in the den for five months now and you're just starting to emerge and the cubs are hungry and you're hungry and you're just exploring the landscape and it's still kind of winter out there um, and they move cautiously to avoid other bears and other predators and uh, and start exploring the landscape and eventually start moving down towards the valley bottom where they might find uh, some food and I went out to sort of check to see if she'd come out of the den um, with some telemetry equipment because she's radio collared and and uh, lo and behold she was a uh, she was starting to move around and uh, and uh, explore the valley and start her season. So, a booming signal and she's up on the slope somewhere. And just above that patch of snow, but I can't quite see her. It's 139. Just a little out of her den now for a week or so. I don't know what she'd be finding to eat up there, but. And just a few days later, 139 started coming down to the roadside, and that little band of greenery that's beside the, the highway and the roadway is about the only food that's available to her at this time of year, unless they get lucky and find a a carcass or something else to scavenge and uh, of course when she shows up near the roadside it it attracts attention from people and people stop to look and photograph uh, the bears but really she's so you know been without food for so many months this is her only opportunity to get food so she really tolerates the people or is is habituated um, to them and that's a pretty exciting experience for people to see them but um, she's kind of in desperate need of nu nutrition and a way to get on with her season. So that was a little exploration of how grizzly bears in Kananaskis country uh, go into the den and come out of the den and uh, yeah, just some of the, the cool things that they, that they do to survive in this landscape and make it through a harsh winter. Thanks for listening. Hi there. 
This is Roland Kersinger. I'm the formal and environmental education coordinator in Fish Creek Provincial Park. I'm standing next to one of the preservation zones that exist here in Fish Creek. The large fence behind me protects a hillside at the west end of the park, Shannon Terrace Day Use Area. And the fence protects the hill because it is the location of a garter snake hibernaculum. So hibernaculum, hibernation, that's right, this is where both wandering and red-sided garter snakes will spend the winter months uh, in natural cavities underground, below the level at which the ground will freeze. That's where these guys can survive. In the spring, typically sometime during the month of May, snakes will start to emerge from hibernation as the spring days warm and then disperse throughout the park. The hibernaculum has been here for many, many years. I've been around Fish Creek for 15, and the hibernaculum was here long before me. The fence to protect the hibernaculum went up even before I arrived. So uh, probably somewhere around 18 or 20 years ago, it was erected to protect the site. So wandering and red-sided garter snakes dispersed throughout the park for the course of the summer. Uh, and then once temperatures start to cool off again in the fall, the snakes will return to find their spot in the hibernaculum uh, in, order to, in order to spend the winter. So, best time to see snakes around? Uh, typically during emergence in the spring. Uh, really warm days uh, in the middle of May are a good bet. But just a reminder, don't try to capture or touch the snakes. They are vulnerable to, uh, to us if we don't know what we're doing. Best to watch them from a safe distance and allow them to go about whatever they're doing. Here we have a lovely little red-sided garter snake hiding in the grass and the dead leaves. Probably just recently emerged from a hibernaculum located at the west end of Fish Creek Provincial Park in Calgary. Red-sided garter snakes can grow up to about a meter in length, but many that we see are the size of this one, uh, approaching half a meter in length, and maybe as big as your little finger in diameter. Red-sided garter snakes are the farthest north-ranging reptile we have. They may range all the way up to the Northwest Territories. Very cold tolerant, they are a reptile that can be found fairly widespread across Alberta. Coiled up in the dappled sunlight amongst the dead grass and leaves is a wandering garter snake. Pale drab, gray-green back, pale dorsal and ventral stripes, and black checks or spots identify this snake for us. Wandering garter snakes can grow to a maximum of about a meter long and like their cousins the red-sided garter snakes they give birth to live young. And the young upwards of 20 centimeters in length will be born later this summer. Wandering garter snakes tend to breed in the spring and with the return of cooler temperatures in the fall They'll make their way back to this hibernaculum to overwinter. Wandering garter snakes and red-sided garter snakes are both hunters of insects, worms, small mammals, small birds, and maybe even eggs of small birds if they can find them. Both are mildly venomous, but not to people. Hi, my name is Vicki Perkins. I'm the formal and environmental education coordinator with Alberta Parks and Kananasas Country. And I'm standing beside a little wetland here in Bow Valley Wildland Provincial Park. One of my most favorite sounds in the springtime is when I get to hear amphibian friends croaking and doing their mating calls. Because that signifies winter's over and they're out of hibernation. Amphibians are older than dinosaurs and were the first group of vertebrates to colonize land 350 million years ago. Now that's amazing. Today there are 6,000 species of amphibians worldwide, 10 of which live right here in Alberta. Amphibians have many adaptations to be successful. 
one of which is our ability to deal with varying temperatures. While our bodies regulate our internal temperature so that it is constantly around 37 degrees Celsius, amphibians are ectothermic or cold-blooded. This means they have very little control over their body temperature and depend on the temperature of their surroundings to regulate their body temperature. The benefit to this is that they use very little energy to stay warm and focus their energy on growth and reproduction. Amphibians have different strategies on how they hibernate and where they hibernate depending on who, the, who you are. Many species go right into the ground and uh, they'll go right down deep enough so that they avoid what we call the frost zone where the ground doesn't freeze. So animals like our long-toed salamander take advantage of that. Then there's other animals that will use ponds, like the one behind me. And they will go right down to the bottom of the pond and they will uh, hibernate in the mud there. So animals like the leopard frog and the Columbia spotted frog take advantage of this strategy. And then there's other animals. And I, oh, I think they're amazing because they have like a superpower. They have the ability to tolerate colder temperatures and will actually hibernate in the top layer where the ground freezes. Now imagine some lettuce if it got frozen, it gets very limpy. Well, these frogs have a special substance that allows their tissues to, to have a natural antifreeze in the form of sugar. And this substance allows them to tolerate the colder temperatures. Well, now that we've learned about how our different amphibians hibernate, let's go on an egg hunt. Let's go see what animals we can find and see if they've woken up from winter. The first amphibian I found was a wood frog, which is distinctive with its black eye mask. These frogs lay eggs as soon as the ice melts. They lay them in plum-sized globular masses and often you will find them in the same spot. Next I saw a boreal toad. These toads vary in color but have reddish brown warts and often a thin light stripe on its back. Their eggs are very distinctive as they look like intertwined robes and can be found on the bottom of the wetland. Columbia spotted frogs, which are larger than wood frogs, are light to dark brown with large irregular spots. Its belly is often a mottled yellow or orange color. Their eggs are laid in orange-sized globular masses, which can be free-floating or attached to vegetation. The last amphibian I found, which is the hardest to see, is a long-toed salamander. They are brownish gray to black with a yellow stripe on its back. They lay their eggs singly attached to submerged vegetation. And if you're lucky, you may see larvae that have hatched. I love amphibians. I think they're an amazing animal. I love hearing their sounds in the springtime and I equally love the number, the countless number of insects that they consume. Their egg and larva also provide a lot of food for other animals like fish and birds and mammals, uh, providing a lot of energy to the food web. Unfortunately, amphibian numbers are declining dramatically worldwide and nobody really knows why. Probably the number one reason is habitat loss or alteration, but there are many other factors such as pesticides or exposure to ultraviolet light. So what can you do to help protect your amphibians? One, don't take them home. This is their home and they don't make good pets. Two, you can support Alberta Parks. Your province has a number of protected areas from north to south, east and west uh, that in part are there to protect the biodiversity of our province. And you might want to consider becoming a citizen scientist. So collecting data on amphibians so that we better understand uh, their populations and what's happening to them. Two examples are the Alberta Volunteer Amphibian Monitoring Program that's run by the Alberta Conservation Association, as well as RANA, Researching Amphibian Numbers in Alberta. For more information, you can go to albertaparks.ca.